Many of us spend a large part of our lives, in one way or another, feeling stuck. That is, in a state where a strong desire to move forward on an issue meets with an equally strong compulsion to stay fixed where one is. For example, we might at one level powerfully want to leave a job in finance in order to retrain in architecture, but at the same time remain blocked by a range of doubts, hesitations, counter-arguments and guilty feelings. So what do you think we're going to talk about today? <laughs> about being stuck. How many of you have felt stuck somewhere in your life at some time? I can tell you that as a pastor, we get to have lots of conversations with people. We get to counsel a lot of people. We get to encourage a lot of people. And I rarely meet people who don't love Jesus in some way or love his church. But one thing that's notable to me is when I'm in conversation with them, how many people feel stuck. They feel stuck in their lives, and it's just a uh, time where it's just uncomfortable. Maybe today you're feeling stuck in a dead-end job. Maybe you're feeling stuck in your retirement. Maybe you're feeling stuck in a family situation. Maybe you're still in, feeling stuck in your sin. Maybe in addiction. Maybe in your parenting. It doesn't matter. When we feel stuck, it's not a comfortable feeling. And can I just tell you that being stuck is not a respecter of man. You can be a worship leader and leading thousands of people in a time of worship. You can be um, a, a bestseller. Uh, you've written a bestseller in the New York Times and you can still feel stuck. You can be a pastor. You can be a connect group leader. You can be someone sitting in this congregation. You could be someone who's well-known or not known at all. You can have a million dollars in the bank or zero dollars in the bank. It doesn't matter. You can still feel stuck. So what I want you to know is, again, that stuck is not a respecter of persons. We all feel it somewhere, sometime in our life. Because you understand this one thing. Stuck is not an external thing. Stuck is a condition of our soul. We're three parts. We are flesh, and our flesh houses our spirit, the very thing that God created and spoke into. And then our soul is our mind. And so often in life, we go through situations and circumstances, and it is the condition of our soul that keeps us stuck. And I don't care who you are, nobody likes being stuck. Nobody likes being stuck in a traffic. Nobody likes being stuck in a long line at the store. Nobody likes um, being stuck in a conversation that you don't really want to be in. We just don't like being stuck. It's an uncomfortable feeling. I remember... Um, Pastor Dom and I travel back and forth from California. Uh, we have family out there, so we take time, and we go out at least a couple of times a year, and um, we've learned how to travel, especially with the changes in the airlines and things like that. But there was this one particular time we were, we'd gone to California, the flight out was good, no hiccups anywhere. On our way back, we, got, we took a shuttle from Ventura, and we went back to, the, to LAX, and we always get there in plenty of time. We do our due diligence. We get there so we can get through our pre-check and get to our gate and give us ourselves time to even buy a meal and you know, get some food in our systems. And then we go to our gate and we sit. And we're very comfortable. And everybody around us is there. They're all coming, taking their seats. And you know, they give you a boarding pass. And on that boarding pass, it tells you what your flight number is. It tells you um, what your gate is. It tells you um, the time that you'll be boarding. It also tells you your seat number. And then when you can expect to arrive in four and a half hours, OK? So we're sitting there. We've eaten. We're relaxed. We're enjoying it. Everybody around us, they're talking. Everybody's you know, interacting acting and you can feel the atmosphere is one of calm. But usually, because we've traveled so much, usually around 20 minutes prior to boarding, you see one of the airline agents go up to the desk and you start seeing them do things and all of a sudden you hear them start to make announcements. 
hey, if you're the parent of children under two years old and you have strollers, car seats, you're going to want to come forward and you're going to want to get them tagged. The next thing is sometimes you hear them calling somebody's random names because there's a problem with their ticket and they need to come forward. Okay? Or they just begin to tell you, you know, the, the, how you're going to line up and things like that. Well, here we are, 10 minutes to boarding and there's nobody at that desk. And all of a sudden, you can literally feel the atmosphere changing in that gate area. You see people looking at their watch. You see people go from being joyful to this scornful look on their face. You can see they're getting angry. Some are getting up. Some are moving around. Ten minutes after boarding, we are standing there, and we have no idea what's going on. I mean, we're like, uh, is somebody going to tell us if there's something going on? Are we getting on that plane? Are we actually going to take off today? So about, I think it was like almost 40 minutes later, somebody comes up, and we had people leaving the gate and going over to the gate next, and they're going, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because they can't tell you what's going on. But it's so frustrating that they wouldn't just come out and tell us, hey, we've identified the problem, here's what's happening, and guess what? You're not going today. Your flight's been canceled. It would have been really nice to know that earlier, okay? Now, isn't that how we often can feel in our own lives with our walk with God? We think that we, we, know, we know when we signed up to walk with Jesus that it was probably going to be a wild ride. We had a feeling it could be. But you know what? It's like some of us are sitting there going, man, God, I haven't even gotten on the ride yet. Like we were sitting there, I'm not getting on this plane today and I feel stuck already. You know what I mean? So no matter where you're at in life, we've all had this situation. But wouldn't it have been nice to have those agents come out when we were supposed to board and begin to give us information? That's how we feel even with God when we feel stuck. Can you just give me a clue? Can you tell me what my next steps are? Aren't you the navigator of my soul? Shouldn't you be giving me some instructions here? So today, as we begin to look at these situations about being stuck, the obvious question is, if we know we're stuck, how do we get unstuck? So that's what we're going to kind of delve into here today, and we're going to talk about that. And let me tell you this. I am not a third-party observer of this situation. I can tell you, and my husband will verify this, in the last few years, excuse me, I've been walking through some things that I have felt stuck in. I mean, you know, I've walked with God for a long time. I know to go to his word. I know that he is the navigator of my soul, but I have just felt so stuck in that situation. A couple of them. There's one big one, they got little appendages. And so you've just felt stuck, and I've had to work, and I've gone to God because I know he's my wisdom. I know he's my knowledge. I know he's the one that can get me unstuck. And any Christian is worth their salt will tell you we've all been stuck. And if we say we haven't, then we're not being honest with ourselves because it can be a family situation. It can be a work situation. It can be a walk with God situation. It can be something that you have no control over, but we've all been stuck and we all need to find out how we can get unstuck. So I want to start this story found in the gospel of John 5. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up. If not, follow along on the screen. Here it is, John chapter 5. If <clears throat> It's about a man in chapter 5, and you guessed it, he's stuck. Okay, so we're going to about, talk about stuck, a stuck man. The heading in the, my Bible says, Jesus heals the lame man. Let's read it. John 5, 1. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, they laid on these porches. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. You know, when I reread this portion of scripture, I thought to myself, 38 years of lying on that porch. 38 years of being stuck. And you know what? I, I brought this mat because um, it's well used, as you'll see. But this mat 
as you can see, is well used, well worn, and it's got marks all over it. And he laid on that dirty mat, that mat that was his for 38 years. Can you imagine the reality of hoping he was going to be healed, but maybe he wasn't? He was stuck. How many of us can take a minute and think about our situation or our circumstance that we've been through or currently in, where we have the mindset or the habit or the sin or the behavior or the attitude that speaks so loudly to us? Can we just imagine what his mindset must have been? Listen, I haven't been, un he's probably thinking, if I haven't been unstuck by now, <laughs> I may never. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you, this, is, this thing you've been stuck in keeps reoccurring. Maybe this thing that you're walking through, you keep going back to. It doesn't matter. You feel stuck. So as we go on, I want to start reading about what this man encountered and who he encountered. In John 5, 6, when Jesus saw the man and knew that he had been sick for such a long time, Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? That's what Jesus asked him. Do you want to be well? Now listen, depending on how you heard me say that or when you read that portion of scripture, how you interpreted it, it could be that you interpret it or heard it wrong. Some of you grew up in religious backgrounds. Some of you grew up in performance-oriented backgrounds. So you might have thought reading that as Jesus asked that lame man that question, you may be coming from a mindset or heart attitude that sounded more like Jesus was saying this. Um, do you even want to be healed? Come on, get it together. So if that was you, I wonder if that performance kind of thing inside of you, that excellence kind of thing in you, you know what I mean? That thing that drew you to hear it that way, what is it that needs to be changed? Because I don't think that's how Jesus said it. I think that you need to understand that when Jesus speaks, you have to remember we're talking about this man at the pool of Bethesda, okay? And at the pool of Bethesda, where all of those porches, those five porches were, I'm a visual person, so I just can imagine all these sick people just around this and just waiting, waiting, waiting. The pool of Bethesda means house of mercy. Can I remind you that we serve a God that's still in the business of meeting people in the house of mercy? Can I remind you that this is the house of mercy? God's house is the house of mercy. And we come, this house is full of inadequate, people with inadequacies, blind spots, brokenness. All of that comes together in the house of mercy. But I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful for the pool of Bethesda because I know I needed mercy. I know I needed God to see my heart and to know that I loved him, but I was stuck somewhere. And yet here we are in a place where now we know how, and we're going to learn how we can become unstuck. So, with that being said, let's get right to the heart of the matter about these things that we feel. How many times have we come to God, and how many times have we said, heal me, deliver me, set me free, and we're feeling like God is just so tired of hearing us. But I can tell you this, that when Jesus spoke to that man, he spoke in a way that was more merciful. It sounded more like, hi, do you want to be healed? Hey, I love you. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be unstuck? He's not a God that isn't full of mercy and love. It's our own interpretation from our own experiences, from our own um, things that we've experienced that create those mindsets in us. So we're crying out now, God, help me. Can you remember the time that you cried out to God and you felt like maybe nothing happened? I can tell you it's not because of a lack of willingness on God's part or a desire to see you whole or well because he truly does want to see you whole. 
He truly wants to see you well. He wants to see you free, and he wants to see you thriving. But I have a question. If you know you're stuck, and you know that there's these situations in your life, and you have to go back to God's word and read the interpretation correctly, see the pool of Bethesda, and know that he's a God of mercy. Address yourself differently. But what are you willing to give him? What are you willing to give him to work with? This was a mat. This is where this lame man lied. And so, what do you have right now? And each of you received a sticker coming in today. And that sticker says, hello, my name is. And the reason I chose those for you, and you don't have to do it now, I want you to listen through the message, is, hello, my name is, we're going to get to it, whatever that area you're stuck in. Okay? I have to tell you that there are many times in my walk with God that I have felt stuck. And I can tell you that sometimes I chose to stay stuck because I was tired, I was exhausted, I was hurt, and I just felt like, you know what, this is more comfortable because this is what I understand. This is something that, you know, I, I, I know how to navigate through, but I, I'm just, I don't want to fight that hard. <laughs> I really don't want to fight that hard. And when I say that to myself, that comment, I don't want to fight that hard, I hear the Holy Spirit remind me continually, but you're not fighting alone. I am fighting with you and for you. But sometimes I'm just more comfortable staying right where I'm at until I get tired of being tired of being tired. Want to hear something really interesting about the gentleman on the mat or the, the people that used to lay on those mats? Scholars speculate that this man might have been motivated to stay on that mat because it was a source of income. Beggars in the ancient times in the Middle East could make lots of money by being a beggar and sitting on a mat. So what is your motivation? Where is it that you are holding on to what is stuck? Why will you not give to God the area that you're stuck in? What is the motivation? Sometimes it's easier to stay stuck than to fight for freedom. At least one is familiar. At least one is comfortable. And at least one looks predictable. You know, I briefly, when I was first starting out in biblical counseling at the church, there was a young woman I worked with for two years, and she came from a battered marriage. And so she came in, and we first started working on her because she needed to know who she was. She needed to know who Jesus was to her, and she needed to know that Jesus saw her differently than she saw herself. Because remember back a few minutes ago when we were talking about the Pool of Bethesda? Sometimes we read the scriptures in the way that we think Jesus sees us and how we see Jesus, and that had to change in her. And so in these moments when I was working with her, where we were building her confidence, we were building her to see who she was first, what had been lost, what she never knew about herself. So as she was growing in this, our next step was to find out what she wanted to do. And because her marriage wasn't changing and the abuse was growing, we started to work with resources around us, organizations around us. So in the next year, we put away money aside. We put clothes aside. She had three children. We started putting clothes for three years down, a year down the road, what they would grow into. We did all of these things. And on the day that she was supposed to pick up her mat and leave, we met her in the parking lot of a grocery store with all the community resources, with everything that she had in her bank account, everything, and she sat there and cried. And I looked at her and I said, why? Why? She goes, because this is what I know. This is what I'm comfortable with. This makes sense to me. I know how to handle the beatings. I know how to not say certain things to irritate or agitate. She goes, this I know. We let her go, and six months later, she made her own move. She chose to get unstuck. So, it's easier to stay stuck sometimes, but it's not healthier to stay stuck. And is it any wonder who... Um, that when we look at all those other people that are standing around the pool, that they're stuck too. So if someone else is stuck, they're certainly not going to get you unstuck. 
okay? Because even in my life, in these areas that I'm working through currently, I have a counselor. I have people that I go to that I feel safe with that are challenging me, that are working with me, and continually reminding me of the mindset and the heart of the Father towards me and what I need to do in order to get myself out of being stuck. So stuck people cannot unstick people. Only those that are healthy, those that are strong, those that have been through it and walked through it can get you from one place to another. So again, unstuck people can't help you. So here's the obvious, okay? We're going to continue with this passage in John 5, 7. Jesus is talking to him, and he remember the question? Do you want to be well? This is what he said. I can't, sir. The sick man said, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Ever been there? Ever thought, God, I feel like I never get ahead? (laughs) Someone's always cutting in the line of my blessing. Someone's always getting their answer to prayer and I'm not. Um, Someone got the promotion. I did not. Um, Why did they get their breakthrough? Okay, so he's sitting there saying, hey, the pool that's supposed to be bubbling, I can't because I can't get myself up and get in there, and somebody is always getting ahead of me. And then we're going to find out why that gentleman was focused on the pool. Here's the point. And how we get out of being stuck, here's uh, number one way to get out to become unstuck. We have to lose our excuses. We have to recognize the words that we're telling to ourselves that convince us to stay in that situation or that circumstance or even a circumstance that's out of your control. It feels like somebody else is controlling it. You have to remember that you cannot use the excuses. The excuses will only keep you stuck. You have to acknowledge them and then you have to recognize them and then you have to get the help to undo them. So one preacher, I thought this was funny, uh, one preacher called these words of the lame man, lame excuses. Sound familiar? Have you ever brought these kinds of excuses to God? God, if I could just have that opportunity, then I'd get my life together. God, if I could just have a better salary, I'd get out of debt. God, if my spouse would just start acting right, then my marriage would work. If I could just find a spouse, then maybe I'd stop trolling the internet in inappropriate places. God, if you could just get the preacher to give me a word, then I can be unstuck. I've talked to so many people who are just coming to me and saying, hey, Tony, just give me a word. I go, I can give you the word of God, but I don't have a word for you today. (laughs) The word is the word of God. But sometimes we want someone else to give us the word that we need to go and find for ourselves through the word of God. We need to find what, what we can use in our current situation. So you have to understand excuses are actually a focus issue. Okay, in this story, you might be wondering, what is that bubbling pool at the at Bethesda? What are they talking about? What is the bubbling all about? There was a belief in those days that an angel would come down and stir the waters, like an ancient jacuzzi, it'd stir the waters up. And when the waters got stirred up, then whoever got in the pool first, one person, one person, whoever got in there first was healed. And that can be pretty frustrating. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thousands of people standing there. Once a year, this might happen. And their focus is on the water and the bubbling water. And yet the living water is standing right there with them. Because Jesus was there at the pool of Bethesda. And he encountered this lame man and he said to him, Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to overcome? Do you want to grow? And so their focus was on the water instead of the living water. And how many times when we get into a situation do we start whining and complaining and that's all we do to God, but we don't go and find him and what his word says to make a difference in what will get us from this place of being stuck. And so if our focus is just on our problem, 
or on our situation or the healing that we, we need, we're only focusing on that thing, then what ends up happening is, is that we negate the living water. We discount the word of God in our lives and says it has no value. It has no value in our life. So listen, it's a focus issue. There's a crowd full of people, hundreds in the presence of Jesus to heal her, but one person gets healed. Well, if that's the case, then once a year, only one person would get healed. <laughs> but if we look to Jesus, then we see what his word has to say. And I love Charles Spurgeon. Um, he's a preacher from the 1800s, and he said it so beautifully. A multitude of, multitude of needy people were there, yet none of them looked to Jesus. A blindness had come over these people at the pool. They didn't even know who he was. They didn't even recognize him. They didn't even recognize his voice. There they were, and there was Christ. There, they, um, Christ, who could heal them, but not one single one of them sought him out. Their eyes were fixed on the water, a focused issue, expecting it to be troubled. There they were, taken up in their own chosen way of seeing that situation instead of looking to the true way. Spurgeon pictured a multitude of people waiting around the waters. And I'm a visual person, so as I told you, I could do that too. And all of them waiting. Instead of looking to Jesus, he thought to himself, as he read this passage as I did, how foolish is this waiting? How foolish is it that they're sitting here waiting for this? Are they waiting for something more convenient, a season that's more convenient to get unstuck? Are they waiting for a dream or a vision to come? Are they waiting for signs and wonders? Are they waiting to be a feeling to compel them? Are they waiting for revival? <laughs> Are they waiting for a cash flow? Wow, I can tell you that people haven't changed. Over the last 150 years, people still look and say the same thing in their places of being stuck. So those questions might resonate with you. But here's the second thing we knew we need to do to uh, get unstuck. We need to lose the labels. We need to lose the labels. Now listen, every year I go through my closets and I purge my spring and, and my, uh, my spring and summer and I, I purge my fall and winter. <clears throat> and some of those things that are in there, as I pull them out and I realized I haven't worn them in a while, but as I'm taking them out of my closet, I'm like, wow, I remember. I like the way I felt in that. I love the color. I love, you know, it just, it just was so me. I really, really enjoyed that. And yet I hadn't worn it in a long time because in reality the seasons of clothing the the styles had changed and I hadn't worn it but it also become a little worn and it didn't have the value that it had when I first had it so I gather up my clothes and I go to a consignment shop and I sit with the girl and she goes through my bags and she kind of picks out what she thinks the consignment shop would use and she begins to label them and she picked out this one item one time that I knew what I paid for it. I knew that I hadn't only worn it a few times, but she labeled it $25. And I was like, really? $25? And the next one's like 10. The next one was like five. And I'm like, wow, I used to own that. I wouldn't have labeled it that way. But what I had to remember is that the value I had for it wasn't necessarily going to be the value the next person had for it because it had been worn, it had been used. And so in that consignment shop, as she puts the little tags and stickers on, and I look at it and think to myself, okay, well, I'm going to make a little bit of money off of this on the outside as well, but she knows her clientele. She knows what they're looking for. That's why she goes through my bag. They tell her what they're looking for. People go, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? And here we are in our situations, and instead of saying, hey, Jesus, do you have this? Hey, Jesus, do you have that? Hey, can I grab this? Can I grab that? What we do is stand back sometimes and think, wow, wow, I don't know what the value of that is anymore. Maybe we set out in life, and maybe we had dreams and aspirations, and here we are 10 years into the game, 20 years into the game, maybe 50 years into the game, and we feel like nothing has happened in our life. Maybe we started out like Naomi, but 
because of a loss and disappointment, she wore the label of bitterness. So, you know, we have these labels, and maybe, you know, we have been wounded or betrayed by somebody, and we wear the label of wounded. But anyway, we're going to just start taking some labels. And so maybe it's addiction. Maybe you're fighting something, and you just need to overcome it, but you don't know how. Maybe in somewhere in your life, somebody hurt you, and they abandoned you. And so you label yourself abandoned, and you're working from these labels. Maybe you had a situation that created great fear in your life, and so now you work from a place of fear. So however we're sitting here and we're labeling ourselves, the Father's up there watching us, and he's looking at every word that we are putting on ourselves: Shame, guilt, insecurity, I like my life of ease, offense, rejection, unforgiveness, comparison, bitterness, betrayal, and all of them lead to feeling like we're damaged. And we have no value. Here you are walking around with all of these labels, all of these things that are weighing you down. And can I remind you that not one of these labels were given to you by God. Not one of these were in the plan that he had for you. He knew you would encounter them, but it's not who he said you were. It's not who he said you should live by, those labels. Those aren't the labels that he wanted you to live by. So if you're living in your labels, you will never get past those labels, and nothing will change in your life. And some of these labels we wear weren't even ones we put on ourselves. Maybe it's words that other people spoke. Maybe it's other people's actions toward us that spoke to one of these other areas, but then became another label that we began to wear. Maybe some of you have been through things in your life where a situation or circumstance, maybe in your marriage, maybe in a job that you had, maybe in your parenting, where you felt like, oh my goodness, you know, I did my best, I gave my all, I've, I didn't, wasn't without excuse or without mistakes that I made, but my goodness, um, now I feel like, you know, I can't move, I can't breathe, I feel like I'm condemned, I feel like I'm broken. Again, if you've allowed other people to label you, or you've allowed yourself to label yourself these, in these ways, it's truly, truly not the way the Father wants you to see yourself. Here's why all of this matters. You will never live beyond these labels. You will never live beyond them. The labels will always speak to you until you speak to them. So those labels that I gave you today, this week when you go home, I want you to say and write down on that. Maybe it's a couple things. You write down and look at that label. And the choice is yours. Do you find value in that label anymore? Do you need that label anymore? Is that where you want to stay? Listen, there's a whole lot of stuck ministries um, that have, in the last year we've seen some moral decays, some moral failures in some of the big name ministries around us. And you can ask yourself, I wonder what happened there. Well, along the way, they got stuck and they limited themselves. And again, most of the damage that even as pastors or leaders of different areas and groups or even a connect group either, or whatever, some of the most damage that we do comes from our identity. And some of the things that we've labeled in ourselves that we have not worked through or asked God to take from us because either we're still familiar with it, it still is okay to us, or we're tired of it, but we just don't want to do the work. You see, um, it's mis misplaced ad identity. If our value is not settled, it's impossible to add values to others. So there's a whole lot of stuck families, a lot of stuck marriages, maybe because of how you grew up, maybe because of marriages you saw, maybe because of the situation, there are things that you're stuck in. Listen to me, if you're a leader of any kind, if you're a business owner of any kind, if you're a parent, a teacher, 
if you're a person of influence, which we all really are, we're a person of influence in our own areas of life, you won't lead anyone past any of their labels if you're still living in your own. So I want you to think about that. No excuses. Change the focus. Identify the labels that you're living in and remove them when you're ready. Because you see, anxious leaders can't bring peace to people. Worried leaders can't bring a calm to the situation. Unholy leaders can't lead holy congregations. Insecure leaders can't lead confident people, at least not for long, because their insecurity starts to show. Distracted leaders can't lead focused teams. Your team, your congregation, your office, your connect group, whatever it is, if you're wearing the label, you're part of the problem, and you will never be able to lead them in any way. Now, I know that doesn't sound encouraging, but there is an answer. So let me remind you of the solution. The value of an item determined by what some, about a value of an item is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. What are you willing to pay for the value of trusting Jesus? What are you willing to pay for the value of Jesus in your life and to help you let go of whatever that label is in your life? Can I remind you that your worth was settled once and for all when Jesus paid the highest price? Your value was settled once and for all when Jesus laid his life down. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus, and you were made his own. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. How many really believe you're his? How many really believe you're his and that he really wants you well and he wants you free and he doesn't want you applying labels or sticking to those labels? He bought you with a price and you're his. And the only person who is allowed to label anything is the one who owns you and he owns you. Amen? Rick Renner had a quote and it's this. Your infirmity doesn't have to become your identity. Your infirmity doesn't have to become your identity. Have you ever heard the old uh, saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure? <laughs> Actually, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's trash. But here comes Jesus and he says, you're my treasure. You're my treasure. And you know what? When he saw you by the wayside, he began to tell us the story of salvation. He knew we were broken. He knew we were bankrupt. He knew we were falling apart from the fall. But he said, I see something in you. I see something in you. Say this with me. Jesus, you see something in me. I choose you. He said, I choose you. I want you to say, Jesus, you chose me. And Jesus, you're going to make something beautiful out of my life. Amen. You might be asking yourself, what happened to that lame man? John 5, 8 says this. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the next word in that scripture, instantly. Instantly. It means he had a choice. It means he could believe or not believe the words of the living water. That instantly he could pick up himself, get his mat off, because he was looking in the eyes of Jesus his focus wasn't on the pool, but it was on Jesus. And when Jesus spoke his word, pick up your mat, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. I say you're healed. Today, Jesus says whatever those areas you're stuck in, if you choose to take the excuses off, if you choose to take the labels off and acknowledge them, if you choose to remember that you're not alone, that if you look to the living water and to the eyes of Jesus, 
He will tell you to stand up, to pick up your mat, and to walk. Some of the greatest areas of my life that, I, that God uses in ministry are the areas I was stuck in. I want you to know that your mat is your ministry. Where you were stuck, where you had great difficulty, where you labeled yourself, God says, I am going to use that. Your mat is your ministry. And can I tell you that if you use your instances, the situations and the circumstances, your mat is your ministry, you'll never run out of things to witness to people about. I know I've got a ton and I use them all the time. I hear somebody talking and I'm listening and I'm listening and I'm letting them know I have value in their words. But I ask them, is that where you want to stay? Because I know the living water. I know this Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says this, Therefore, I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Are we broken? Yes, but every day we get to be healed. Every day we get to make one step closer. Every day we get to acknowledge that we're not in this alone. That not only do we have Jesus, but he's bringing other people to us that we can be, that are unstuck to help us and guide us and lead us. Every miracle is made up of a mat. One preacher said it beautifully, and I love this. I can just see this. <laughs> I love this. I want my mat to become the red carpet of God's grace. So even though this mat here is dirty, I want this mat to speak about my weaknesses. But in my weaknesses, there was one who made me strong. There was one that grew me, one that changed me, one that gave me a hope. I want my mat to become the red carpet for Jesus. Amen? And thirdly, you have to have a vision. You have to see the excuses, see the labels, and you have to have a vision for how you're going to do that. Now, not only is God asking us to lose those things and just get a different vision, he's asking us to create from those things how we want it to look differently. So when you write those labels out this week, when you are sitting there looking at those excuses and those excuses and how they labeled you and where you're stuck, then go to his word and find a scripture. Go to the living water and spend time with him and ask him to lead and guide and direct your steps. And then ask him to help you have a healthy vision of where you are now to the where you want to be. For me, I go and look for pictures. I cut out. I bring up things on my phone. I have like on my phone a, um, a, a future uh, vision board. And I put things on it in different areas of my life. I want to tell you about a vision, okay, and what vision does for you. There was a, a in Flagstaff, Maine, there was a town known as the town that drowned. It was a town in the 1950s that found out that in a year it would be fully submerged underwater. A man who lived there noted a strange observation as the year went on when the future was to be no more. It stopped all progress. People stopped caring about their houses. No one did their lawns or painted. Because why? If they weren't going to exist anymore, then why? Then why do it? He made this observation, where there is no hope in the future, there is no power for the present. So if you've lost your hope, you've got to get back to the living water to refresh yourself, to restore yourself, to allow yourself to get a vision for what you want yourself to look like what you want that situation to look like, what you want your marriage to look like, what you want your business to look like, what you want your grandchildren to look like. You've got to have a vision. But if there's not hope for the future, then you're absent of the power for the present. So we have to get a clear picture. In Proverbs 2, 29, uh, Proverbs 29, 18, it says, without a vision, people perish. Do you have a vision? I know you have a vision of where you're stuck. I know you know it. I know you know exactly where you're at. But I'm saying to you, let's get a new vision. Let's get a new hope. Let's let the power of God's name work in our present. 
Maybe some of you are stuck in the past and you just need the help to forgive yourself for being stuck there. God can, can forgive that as well. And Paul says this, this one thing I do, I press on. Are you ready to press on? Remember how I said earlier that I have times in my life that I'm stuck and didn't want to be unstuck? Well, maybe here's the answer to that that can go along with your vision. Philippians 2.12. So work with fear and trembling to discover what, is really meant, what it really means to be saved, what it really means to walk with Jesus, what it really means to allow the word of God to be present and the power of it in your life. 13, the verse says, God is working in you to make you willing so you're able to obey him. So I want to say this before I close. Can we change out our labels? Can we take off that I have no value? That I'm damaged? I'm fearful. I'm full of shame. I'm stuck in my addiction. I've been abandoned. Can we take the labels off? and choose to put the label, I'm his, I'm his. I'm nobody else's because I was bought and paid for with a price. I'm his. Can you take your mat and stand up and roll it up and walk? I know it's not easy. I know that sometimes it just seems too hard. But remember, you're not in this alone. Not only is Jesus with you, but those that you feel safe with are wanting to walk right along with you to encourage you, strengthen you, build you, support you, and bring you back to your true identity. And that is you are his. And once this mat is rolled up and you make those changes, this mat becomes your ministry. It becomes the inroad to conversations to lead people to Jesus. And that's why we're here, is to lead Jesus, lead people to our precious, precious Jesus. And then we want to use that mat to be a red carpet of grace for others that are watching. Bow your heads. If you're sitting here today and you say, you know, Pastor Tony, I've been so stuck for so long. I know those areas of my life, but you know, I've grown really tired. I've grown really worn out. Or the label is, this is all new to me. I, don't, I just think I can get through it. I just don't know what to do with it. If that's you and you're sitting here and you are feeling stuck, I just want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Let's everybody do this, if, even if currently you're not stuck. Say, Father, I acknowledge that I'm stuck. I acknowledge my excuses. I see the labels. Today, I want to give you something to work with. I want to give you myself in my brokenness, in my, uns in my stuckness. And I believe, Father, that I can become unstuck when I acknowledge the giver of life, the refresher of my soul, the one that's called me by my name and labeled me his. Father, I just thank you right now in Jesus' name that you know the hearts of those that are sitting here. I thank you that your Holy Spirit's gonna move mightily and work through these situations. And this will not just be a one-time sermon for today. But Father, keep bringing it back to them and back to them and back to them till they get to the place of where you want them to be. Now listen, head still bowed. If you said, Pastor Tony, I don't know this Jesus in the way that you've just explained him today, that he's a God of mercy and 
He's a God that doesn't label me with all the things that I've labeled or even in the midst of my stuckness and how I don't feel like I've ever even gotten on the plane or gotten on the ride yet. doesn't matter. I just feel like I've never gotten anywhere. And you don't know this, Jesus. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I'm going to have everyone in the congregation pray it with me. Jesus, I come to you with all my brokenness, with all my insecurities, with all my blind spots. And I realize that all of those are sin. You said in your word, we've all fallen short. But you came to give us life and life more abundantly. Today I choose you, Jesus, because I know you already chose me. Come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. I acknowledge you and will not neglect you in the days ahead. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name.